Hello, welcome to Oxford History Today. This is a new series brought to you to explain some of Oxford's great history. I'm your host, Ron Brock, and I'm president of the Northeast Oakland Historical Society. And I'll be bringing the shows to you and bringing the guests to explain a little bit of our history. Uh, we thought to kick the series off, we would explain the history of the building itself. Uh, here at 1 North Washington, there was originally a wooden structure which was a mercantile, and that was owned by the Hagermans, Alfred and James. They operated that mercantile here until 1899, when they tore the building down and put up a two-story brick building. Now at the time they were putting this building up, they were also laying the tracks for the DUR, which is a trolley that ran from Detroit to Oxford and later on to Flint. Uh, this building, being brick, was also a two-storefront building and there were many businesses that occupied the building. Here at the very corner was the Michigan Central Ticket Office and Telegraph. Uh, to the north in that storefront was Blanchard's Saloon. Up above that was a billiards hall. There was also a barber shop in the basement. And there was also a cigar store here. So there had been many things that occupied this building. In 1920, Oxford Savings Bank bought the building. At that time, they gutted it, uh, tore out the center. They had to do a lot of rework to put in the two vaults that are here now. There's one on the main floor, and there's also one on the basement. Uh, the bank refurbished it, turned it into a one-story building. They kept one of the second floor rooms as a board office. They covered the building with Indiana limestone, which at the time was to show the building was very strong and indestructible and very safe for the customers to keep their money in. Uh, they stayed here for 44 years, and in 1966, they moved to their new building now down at 60 South Washington. The building stayed vacant for quite a few years, and in 1971, the Northeast Oakland Historical Society was formed. At that time, the president of the bank, Mr. Robert Dick, was very instrumental in establishing this museum. The bank donated the building to the village to be used as a museum. So after several months of hard work, cleaning, organizing, bringing in donations, uh, arranging the artifacts, it was in uh, August the 5th of 1972 that the museum opened. And it's been serving the community ever since. One of the people who were so instrumental in developing this museum was Mildred Schmidt. She devoted basically her life to bringing this museum into being. She donated many of her personal heirlooms, countless hours, and a good deal of money to establish this museum. And that's the way the thing has come about, uh, is operating today, and still serving the community. During the time that uh, we have been discussing the history of this building, some of the things that happened in Oxford, or what really brought Oxford to about, was the railroads that came through town. At one time, there were three railroads that went through Oxford. And that was really the impetus for starting a, a larger community. At the time, it was basically agriculture that the town grew upon, and having a way to get their produce and goods to the market really helped Oxford out. They uh, had a few of the industries here that were related to agriculture, would be the uh, apple dryer. There was one over on E Street where they dried apples. Uh, there was the Oxford Flake Company, which was a mill that was converted to make uh, cereal flakes for breakfast. And there were other things in the area that happened also. Uh, a couple of them was the Oxford Carriage Company. Uh, they were on the southern part of town. They built carriages, wagons, and actually produced one automobile. They couldn't find a backer for that automobile, so there was only one made. Uh, that brought us into the automobile needing roads. Uh, Oxford, of course, was just a dirt road. That's what Washington Street was, was a dirt road with a railroad track running right down the middle of it. And as you can imagine, with the horses, the rain, the mud, it was kind of messy. 
And with the advent of the automobile came pavement. And what do we need for pavement? Gravel, cement, and sand. And Oxford happened to be sitting on one of the largest gravel deposits there was. And that's what really put Oxford on the map, known as the gravel capital of the world. Uh, as these people developed the gravel pits, uh, railroad cars were required to move the gravel economically, and that's why we really had the three railroads. And that kind of brought about other developments in the area that brought Oxford into the larger city or town that it is today. And I thought maybe now that we should walk around our museum, we can show you some photos of the time periods we're talking about. And we can show you some of the buildings uh, where the businesses were operated. And we just thought that might be a way to introduce you to our museum. Hi, Terry. Hi, let's look around. And welcome to our place. museum. Oh, thanks. Let's look at some of the old shots that you've got going on here. Here, this is one of my favorite places in town to be. Not only can you feel the history, but you can see it too. And I'm a history buff. Great. I appreciate what you do here at the museum. And I know that you were talking a little bit about the history of the building. Right. And history of the community. It's not just the Oxford community that you have a history of though, right? It's right. Lake Orion, Addison. It's all, yeah, it's all in Northeast Oakland County. Uh, Lake Orion, Addison, Lakeville, Leonard, Thomas, Oakwood. They all have a little bit of a story to tell. And they all kind of depended on each other, right? That's true. Yeah, we're kind of all interlaced together, right. you know. Uh, one time, we were all about the same size, really. And <laughs> it was the railroads that really made Oxford pull ahead. Oh, yeah. You know, like Lake Orion. Take Lake Orion here. Uh, they had the amusement park. They were the big vacation spot for the Detroiters. Uh, Sunday morning, they would jump on the DUR, which was a trolley come up here to Lake Orion, go on the boats over the amusement park, spend the day, then get back on the trolley and go back to Detroit to go back to work. So they had a very big history there. And they had, they had a lot of wealth, actually, in that community around that time. Yes, they did. I know a little bit about the history of the Scripps Museum and the mm -hmm. Scripps people, and, and that was all around that same time, and, and the, the island was just such a draw. And I also understand there was a church group that brought a bunch of people out here, too, and then they ended up making it their home. Yeah. And, of course, they're going to need something from Oxford. <laughs> now, Certainly. this was a great agricultural community, That's true. right? That's yeah. yeah. It's, it was for years and years. I even remember it being sure. an agricultural community. And Addison, the same. Yeah. And did each community have their own mill, or how did, the, how did their yeah, mill Yeah, pretty go? much they had their own mill. They had their own grain elevators, you know, and it went on that way. Uh, Lakeville, uh, they still have a, their mill building there. Leonard still has their uh, grain <laughs> elevator there, and they're trying to develop a museum out there, and we wish them all the best. Yes, uh-huh. Thomas, it's always funny. Uh, yeah, it's still there, this little town of Thomas. Uh, Oakwood is nothing more today than a party store at the corner. But at one time, it was a pretty good-sized village. Now, at the same time, mm -hmm. didn't Oakwood and Thomas kind of get wiped out by the quote-unquote cyclone? Yeah, that was 1896. Uh, a big tornado, which then they called the cyclone, came through. And it came from the west, uh, hit Ortonville, came across completely obliterated Oakwood, went on to Thomas, destroyed some there, and continued on. Oakwood really had to bear the brunt of this thing. And uh, we can talk about some of the artifacts that we have here from when the tornado did go through Oakwood. Well, let's go have a look at those. We'll sure. wander on over that mm -hmm. way.
small town with a lot of heart and history. A hidden gem with a sense of community. Welcome to Leonard. If we take a look up here in our church scene, you'll see a pulpit up here, a very pretty one. And that was actually in the church uh, that was at Oakwood. Now the church itself was completely destroyed, leveled to the ground, and that was the only thing that remained. Isn't that something? It was donated to us, and uh, so we've preserved it and it's here on display for people to see. Now, how did the history, it was its own little community, mm -hmm. but now, nowadays we consider Thomas Oxford. Yeah. They still yeah. have their own, they don't have their own post office no. or anything, right? They did. Oakwood, they used to have their own post office. As a matter of fact, I can show you the postmaster's cancellation stamp. Oh, let's go look. Let's have a look at that. Yeah, Terry, in this display case, uh, you can see the postmaster's cancellation stamp. <laughs> and if you notice, uh, the date is even still on that. Oh my goodness, the date? That, the yep. day of the cycle. Yep, May 25th, 1896. Wow. Uh, a farmer found that in his field about two or three miles away, quite a few years later. He was wow. plowing his field up, found something shiny, and lo and behold, there it is. Isn't that something? Talk about documentation of what oh, happened. Yeah, yeah. Wow. And this, uh, the, this is also from the cyclone? Yeah, this is still from the cyclone. Uh, in the back here we have a piece of tree bark and that was a tree that was damaged during that cyclone. And somebody in saved Oakwood, that. And somebody oh, saved isn't it. That something? And here we have a lot marker uh, and that was found in Thomas. Oh. And that was also uh, part of the pathway of that uh, tornado it went through Thomas also. Explain to me a little bit about what the lot markers are all about. I've seen them. I've just... Um, yeah, they they were put on the... Since Thomas was really laid out as a small town with mm -hmm. city lots, mm -hmm. each lot had a marker on there to, to indicate what lot that was on the plat map. Oh, and is that how they derived it? At addresses, or was it before addresses, or no? They would have had their they would have had their own post office too, and uh, I'm not that sure that they had a street address, if you will, at that ah, time. Ah, ah, that was quite a while ago, 1896. Six, yeah. And what else is what else do we have in this case? This is so interesting. Yeah, we have quite a few different things here. Uh, here we have some picture hanging nails. For heaven's sakes, I didn't know there was such a thing. Yeah, they're kind of unique. Uh, think about back then, you had plaster walls, and so you couldn't really just hang a picture wherever you wanted to, because you're going to crack and break up the plaster. Oh, yeah, that old horse hide, horse hair. And... Horse hair plaster, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So they put up a picture rail, is what they called it. Oh. And they went all the way around the room, and you would use that rail to hang your pictures from. Sometimes they had hooks that were very decorative, and then you would have chain or some kind of ribbon or yarn to hang your picture with, or you used a picture hanging nail. And they're so, they look like that Victorian era. Quite exactly. Elaborate that's exactly and when they're from. Wow. Yeah. And so everything that's in here, in these cases, have been donated or on loan, right, from people everything in the Everything in the museum has been donated, or we have a few items on loan. But yeah, it's, it's all donations from the communities. Uh, we have not purchased one article to be displayed here. And I know that you went to the, the museum and I know that you and the board put a lot of time and energy into this to reorganizing, if you will, the museum back in the spring, right? Yeah, we did this two years ago. Uh, the museum closes every February for maintenance, cleaning, ah. just catching up on things that need to be done. And the board decided that the museum needed a new look. <laughs> and so through several meetings, that we sat on a floor plan, uh, decided that, okay, maybe the best way to display our artifacts would be to develop some vignettes of here, of different rooms, mm -hmm. Victorian times, see the way rooms actually looked at that time. And that's what we set out to do. Uh, we set up a church scene up above the stairway. Mm -hmm. Got a dining room here, a parlor, we have a children's room, we've got a music room. In the lower level, we've got a kitchen, we've got a farming area, we've got a carpentry area. 
And we just wanted to break it up so that we were displaying things of a like nature rather than have things sense. scattered everywhere. Right. It and to sense. give people more access to what's in these cabinets right. and to get a closer look. Uh, and it gives you a sense of what the feel was like. This definitely feels like Victorian era with the, the piano, the very ornate piano. Right. Yeah. It definitely um, gives you a sense of where we came from. Exactly. Which yeah. is the point of the museum in the first place. And, uh, and let me say, for the people in this community, thank you for dedicating your time and energy thank to you. do that. I have never seen, I've seen the basement from the stairs only. So can we take a look around there? We can down sure there take a step down talk there. Talk about the cool yeah. stuff that's down there. Yeah, we, we did the same thing this past spring downstairs, reorganized the basement. And so, yeah, I'd be glad to show it to you. Okay, let's go look. Yeah, Terry, this is what a kitchen would have looked like back in the turn of the century, late 1800s, early 1900s. And this would be before there was electricity, so we'll have to excuse the lights that we have in here. <laughs> yeah. Uh, old kitchens had the big wood stove, and uh, those things were so huge, we did not put one in here for that sure. reason. It would yeah. take up the whole room. Uh -huh. We have a photo of one there, a picture. This is an electric stove that we just recently was donated to us, and it's uh -huh. one of the first models. How neat. Uh, behind you here, we have a kerosene stove, small. Oh, yeah. Real little. And think about the big wooden stove. Think about the middle of August. Uh, oh. You're going to want to stoke up a big wood fire to cook dinner no. in, in the house now. <laughs> no. So people use these little kerosene stoves oh. during the summer. They were very small, and they would cook on those. And then, uh, you know, fall came, winter, when you wanted some heat, they would go back to using the oh, wood cooking stove. I did not realize that. Yeah, yeah. Which makes sense. Usually those... The older homes have quite a large size kitchen sure. just mm -hmm. to accommodate that stove. And that's where they did everything. They baked their bread. They did, they Family did life was out. there. Yeah. yeah. Did the laundry in there. Everything. Oh, my yeah. Gosh. yeah. Yeah, that's amazing. And they didn't have just one or two kids. No, no. <laughs> large families, especially on the farms. They needed mm -hmm. the help uh, to raise their crops. You sure. know, so they had large, large families. Right. Yeah. That's a lot. Of, it was a lot of work. I'm yeah. telling you. That's Some of the items that we have in here yeah. that uh, they used at the time. Again, behind you, this is what they called the Dutch oven. Oh, looks and like a microwave. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You would set that over that. A, over your stove, and you could bake in this actually. And ah. um, they still use them today when you're camping on your Coleman stove. You put a Dutch oven on Makes it, sense. and you could bake biscuits or, or bake a Cakes, cake or whatever you wanted. Yeah, roast a chicken. Yep, or... they still use them. Wow, isn't that something? Mm -hmm. And over in the corner, we have a Hoosier cabinet. Mm -hmm. That was kind of a central item in the kitchen because you stored sugar there, you stored your flour there. You had an enameled surface there that you could do all your baking on as far as like kneading bread and stuff like that. It was very, a uh, very, very handy piece of furniture to have in your kitchen. And, and still um, wanted by many today. Oh yeah, they're quite popular. They're very quite beautiful, popular. really. Yeah. That's just a, the kitchen workhorse. Mm -hmm. And they didn't have refrigeration at that time, nope. right? Nope, nope. Again, we're before electricity, so every house had a icebox. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of an interesting story on the icebox. Um, what they would do is go out, cut ice off of the lakes and the rivers and they would store it in an ice house. And that was a building that had about two foot thick walls. They would fill the walls with sawdust, bring the ice in there, oh. throw sawdust on it, more ice, more sawdust, and that's how they kept and ice insulated. through the summer. Yeah. Wow, mm -hmm. this is And when you, when you had your ice box, you had a delivery, man, <coughs> excuse me, a delivery man that would bring you your ice. You would put a sign, something like this, in your back window. And that would tell the ice man, how much ice you wanted him to leave you, depending it upon counts. what you had going on. Yep, 75 pound block or oh 100 pound gosh. block. And so that would tell him how much ice you wanted. Wow, isn't that something? And uh, he would bring the horse drawn carriage over to your house, you know, and with ice tongs, really? bring in the block of ice. <laughs> and you would leave him a coupon. 
sitting on top of your ice box. Oh, because you buy them ahead of time. You buy them ahead of time. Oh, for and that sakes. is broke up into 25 pound increments. Ah. And so that way he could come whenever and uh, just deliver your ice because of course back then nobody locked their doors. Right, of course. And uh, just leave your ice and away you went. Wow. And the, is it around the same time that there were milk deliverers? About that time, well? the milk deliveries. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yep. If mm -hmm. you didn't happen to have a a you didn't have a cow out and back, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So they keep that. Uh, they probably had deliveries more than once a week. Oh yeah. Because yeah, it would, would go to. bad, of course. Sure. I'm sure it must have been difficult to keep things fresh. <laughs> yeah, it would be. Mm. And uh, the kids really loved to see the ice man come around because he would take an ice pick and chop Chops off a little off. chunk of ice, uh -huh. and the kids would eat that, and they thought that was cool. <laughs> I'm dating myself because I can remember. The milk delivery guy doing that for us. He'd I can remember that. <laughs> okay, well, and then we, there must be a workroom here? Where yeah, we have several different workrooms here, and we'll go on to them. Before we'll we leave, yeah. I want to show you, this is an ice cutting saw. Oh, my goodness. And they would use that, again, like I said, on okay. the lakes and on the rivers to cut the ice. Oh, my. And then put it on a sled and haul it into the ice house. It must have taken more than one guy to do oh, that. Oh, yeah. Huh? Uh, several guys worked on that. <laughs> well, these, the old houses, I'm noticing the, the woodwork here, and of course, you probably didn't pull that out of an old house, but the houses back in the 1800s mm -hmm. were a fine piece of craftsmanship. Well, very, usually, very, usually very ornate, yeah. Mm -hmm. These partitions uh, actually came from the old bank that was upstairs. Oh, okay. Uh, they were used for the president's office, uh, and that's, that was where the fireplace is. And they uh -huh. were also used for the teller cages. Oh. So we were able to preserve Recycle. some of the things. Right, yeah. very good. Mm -hmm. Well, and it also reminds me, I had a house in Oxford built in 1875. Okay. And there, there was definitely ornate woodwork in that house. Sure. Yeah. It's, um, they don't build them like they used to, that's for sure. No. Oh, and speaking of building them, I want to go on and see their tools. Too. Okay, we'll do that right now. Okay. Hi, I'm Connie from Connie's Kitchen here on OCTV, which is channel 99 on AT&T and 191 on Charter. Join us here on OCTV, join me in Connie's Kitchen, and learn to have fun in the kitchen to relax and enjoy yourself. Come on, it's, it, what, what'll it hurt? You'll have a good time. Canine Stray Rescue is Oxford's own local dog rescue. Each year they take in hundreds of dogs and bring them into suitable homes. A certified nonprofit organization, Canine Dog Rescue strives to give pound dogs a new leash on life. To donate, adopt, or even volunteer, call them at 248-628-0435 or go to their website, dogsaver.org and click on the K9 Stray Rescue League link. Hey Lakeville, you're watching OCTV. Hello, I'm Elgin Nichols. And I'm Dave Kenny. And together Dave and I host a program called Minutes by Minute. We discuss what local Oxford and Addison politicians and appointed representatives are doing to make your life happy or miserable by passing laws, ordinances, and regulations that affect you. We believe that within those political decisions is humor. You just have to hunt for it. For example, did you know there's a local ordinance that allows people to shoot off fireworks 24 hours a day, 365 <laughs> days a year? But since they can do it, nobody wants to do it. Catch us Monday through Friday on Charter 191 and ATT Universe 99, scheduled for 7 a.m., 11 a.m., and 10.30 p.m., or go to our webpage, occtv.org, and click on Programs. I'm Elgin Nichols. And I'm Dave Kenny. Each week, catch us on Minutes by Minute. Don't miss it. Yeah, Terry, we were talking about them doing their laundry in the kitchen area. Yeah. Speaking of and, tools, right? <laughs> right. And uh, here are some of our laundry Oh, my things. goodness, look at that. Oh, yeah. You know, we talked about the big wood stoves, and uh, they had an area there called a boiler where they would heat the water, or else they would put a big 
tub on there that they would heat their water in. And that's how they did their laundry, uh, how they washed their dishes, and how they took their baths. Oh, they heated the water up for their baths. On the stove, <laughs> oh, yeah. miserable. Of course, if you were the youngest <laughs> child, you got the dirtiest water. Yeah, yep. right. Yeah, I've heard that before. And then... Ironing wasn't an easy task either. No, right? no, they had to heat up, heat up their irons. Uh, and we have a display of uh, kind uh, of a history of the irons. Sure. Early ones were what we call a sad iron. Sure. And mm -hmm. here's one here. You would have three or four of these. You would put them on the top of the wood stove, heat them up, iron with it until it cooled off, and you'd put that on the grab stove and one. grab another one and do the ironing with that. Now there's some irons, I happen to have one, where there's a lever on it and the, the actual iron part comes out of the handle. What's mm -hmm. the, why is that? What's the uh, that, that was just another way of doing it. This is one of the Oh, so they just left those and then put the just handle one on handle. and grab it. Yep, grab uh, one for each Convenience. <laughs> Modern convenience for them, right? And then they came to the charcoal iron, which is this one. Oh my goodness. You would put hot coals in there that would heat up your iron, so uh. you you could iron with that. And from there, they went to the gasoline iron, where they used white gas, Ooh, similar to what you use in a lantern or a yeah. Coleman stove. Yeah. yeah, you'd have to pour white gas in here, pump it up, get pressure on it, light it. That's why a lot of the houses burnt down, you know? <laughs> sure. And you know, that was a dangerous job just keeping house, I'm sure. Sure. So on our next segment, I, I, there's so much to look at down here. I, we passed a whole bunch of hardware tools, so we're going to have to pick up where we left off on our next segment. I want to find out how they got these houses built in the first Sounds place. Sounds great. And more about Oxford's history. Thank you. Uh, thank you for starting this show. Mm -hmm. Thank you for doing this show. I'm really looking forward to future shows and finding out more about Oxford's history. See you next time. Thank you. Mm -hmm. This is OCTV, Oxford Community Television, serving Oxford and Addison Townships with the best in local programming. On Charter Channel 191, AT&T U-verse Channel 99, and our website, OCCTV.org. OCTV, we provide local programming that brings you closer to home. Your local business. Your police department. Your local business. Your village of Oxford. The schools. Yeah, Your parks and recreation. Your community. Your community. Only on OC TV.